Hello and welcome to the Remap IOD event. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of um, a large consortium of researchers and patients around the world working on this project. It's an absolute pleasure to have you have you here with us um, today um, to learn more about the project and provide an update and offer an opportunity for you to ask us your questions too. So um, just so you can have a sense of who's logged into the call today, um, we've got um, people from all around the world, um, UK, Mexico, Taiwan, Lebanon, Australia. So for some of you, middle of the night and early in the morning, um, thank you for joining us. Please be aware that you can use Zoom captions. They're enabled um, in this webinar. So if you prefer to um, have a caption translation on your screen, you can select that. Um, select that today. Um, we're also joined today by some of our um, patient organisations um, from around the world and we thank you for your support of this really important project. During the next hour and a half you're going to hear from a wide variety of people involved in this project. Um, Gisley is going to introduce Remap ILD, this innovative platform um, trial for understanding treatments for progressive pulmonary fibrosis, um, followed by the patient perspective, Peter, Sharma, Pepe and Ian. And then Letitia give us an update of how the project is running at this time. And then Chris and Sydney will talk to us about two groups of potential treatments that we could run in this platform trial. And then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, Gisley Jenkins um, to lead on understanding more about um, Remap ILD. And our, our vision overall is that we want to find effective treatments faster for patients with pulmonary fibrosis around the world. And this is what you'll be learning about today. So thank you, Wendy. Thank you for that introduction. So yeah, I'm here to talk about what Remap ILD is. Oh, go for my clicker. Oh, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Ooh. So why is Remap ILD important? Well, we know we need to have new and better treatments uh, because at the moment we have two treatments which slow the progression of disease, but neither represents a cure. And unfortunately, people will still progress when they start on these treatments. At the current time, <clears throat> pardon me, it takes about 10 years to go from uh, first recognizing a treatment might be beneficial to getting that treatment uh, established into the clinic. And that's clearly far too long for patients with pulmonary fibrosis. Furthermore, we have a system whereby at the moment we have a research track and we have a clinical care track and they're often separate. But we know that patients who participate in clinical trials do a lot better and benefit their, their outcomes are better if they are involved in research. So we need to combine clinical care with research. And this has been very effective in the treatment of cancers, for example. So our core values are to remember why we are doing this. And we're doing this to help patients to prolong lives and to improve quality of life and to do this we want to work together internationally this is a global effort because pulmonary fibrosis is indiscriminate uh, and it doesn't it doesn't really care unfortunately about any anything and so we need to work together uh, to to increase our efforts to improve uh, outcomes and so we're working on being very inclusive and we inclusivity means including all patients with pulmonary fibrosis. And this is often not the case because many clinical trials have large exclusion criteria, but we want to include all regions, regions of the world who may not normally get involved in clinical trials and all physicians. So not just specialist centers, but secondary care and if, if appropriate, primary care, but we want to be very inclusive because together we are all stronger. So when we think about a traditional clinical trial, we have a hypothesis, 
which basically states that we do not think that the treatment will be better than a placebo. And so to test this hypothesis, we select patients, often with very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria, to participate in the trial, and we give them an active drug, and then we give uh, the other, uh, uh, at random, another group of patients, a placebo. And we estimate how many patients we would need to put in the trial to prove our hypothesis is false. So how many patients would we have to treat to see a difference and for that difference to be not the result of random chance? And when we hit that number, the trial stops. And sometimes we've got our estimate wrong. And so we reach the end of the trial and we don't have an answer because we haven't recruited enough patients because our prior estimate to test the hypothesis was wrong. And this is a major problem with traditional clinical trials because you can't adjust the numbers during the trial. That's not how the, the hypothesis or the statistics work. In remap trials, we have a different approach. Not only can we test more than one drug, we can test many more people because we have less inclusion exclusion criteria. And also because we're always learning as we're doing the trial, we don't stop at a specific number, we stop when we get the answer, which I think most people would realize is much more intuitive. If we want to know if treatment A is better than control or better than treatment B, we keep going until we know that answer. Whereas in a traditional trial, we would stop at a given number. And that's a, a fundamental difference. And the other thing about remap trials is they can assess many different treatments and many different types of treatment. So you can compare treatments such as uh, different drugs within the same class, or you can compare drugs with physical therapy, for example. So they're a lot more flexible. So what does REMAP stand for? And this is fundamental because this basically tells us what the trial is. So it's randomized, which means that a person being uh, recruited to the trial will get therapy or control at random. So it's not chosen for that patient. It's embedded, which means the research is embedded in clinical care, which means most of the data that we collect to answer the question should be collected as part of a routine care visit rather than requiring an extra research visit. And this improves efficiency. Multifactorial means that we assess many drugs and adaptive means that we do the statistics on the go so that we can change the number of people in a given arm or we can extend the length of the trial because it's taking longer to get an answer. But it basically means we're learning from the data that we accrue from the moment the first patient is included in the study. And P stands for platform, and that's the infrastructure that enables us to do the trial. And so what this means is that we can test many treatments at once, which is obviously beneficial in terms of trying to get to an answer for multiple treatments quickly. We save time, and we save money through embedding and through uh, accruing information more quickly. And ultimately, this means we get answers, whether the answer is positive or negative, much more quickly than using a traditional trial. And so what we're trying to do is to generate the infrastructure globally so that we're all operating on the same protocol, so that everybody is doing the same thing regardless of where they are in the world. And that means we can amalgamate the data and again, get to answers much more quickly. So the benefits are that we include many more patients, we include many more countries and we include many more centers. We have a set of people who reflect the sorts of people who would normally be requiring therapy rather than uh, patients who are selected for a particular clinical trial. And this is often a problem that the patients that we see in our clinics are not always the same. They don't have the same set of comorbidities. They don't have the same set of issues as patients recruited into a traditional clinical trial. And because we are learning as we do the trial, what that means is that we can enrich uh, the, the, 
patients into arms where there is apparent benefit, which means that your chance, a patient's chance of getting benefit from participating in the trial is, is increased. Now in a traditional clinical trial, we have to consent patients and let them know that there is no actual benefit from being in the trial because we don't know until the end of the trial whether the, the drug A was better than placebo or, or drug B. Whereas in a remap trial, we can say with confidence that as the trial continues, if you're randomized into, a, into an arm, the chances of it being successful are higher because we're always uh, learning from the data. And this is what we mean by adaptive. We, knew, we use new information as we get it, and this improves the trial. And we, when we have an answer, we stop testing the treatment. We know who is given the treatment and how many patients are needed all the time. We adjust this information. So by way of example, what we, when we start the trial, we may randomize three people to receive treatments A, B, and C. Then after a few months, we would do some data analysis. And we may find that treatment B is working better than A and C. And therefore we would increase the number of people who are being randomized to B. And this obviously leads to longer term benefits. Oops, sorry. So what we're trying to do is use this classical trial structure, which has been used very effectively for uh, community acquired pneumonia in remap cap to treat patients with fibrotic ILD. So what does ILD stand for? It stands for interstitial lung disease. There are many of these diseases that can cause some degree of inflammation or scarring. And in fact, most patients will have some degree of scarring and there are a few patients who have nothing but inflammation. And so most people with most types of interstitial lung disease listed under this umbrella here would be able to participate in this trial because most of these uh, groups of patients will have some degree of scarring, plus or minus a degree of inflammation. So we hope that this will help us find treatments that slow or stop lung scarring and even better reverse lung scarring over time. We also hope that the, we will find treatments that not only improve longevity, but will also improve quality of life uh, and make patients' lives better. And importantly, we hope to be able to standardize and optimize the care that patients receive around the world. So I'll stop there and uh, hand back to Wendy. Thank you, Gisley. That was a really great introduction to remap trials generally and, and, and particularly in um, interstitial lung disease. Um, and now um, it gives me great, great pleasure to invite Peter Sharma, Ian and Pepe to give the patient perspective on remap ILD. So if you'd all like to join me on screen now. Ian and Sharma, I invite you to switch your cameras on as well and Lovely, thank you. <laughs> Good evening all. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, so having your involvement in this project is absolutely fundamental and you represent a wider group of patients that have been involved in the design and development of, of this initiative. Um, and I, I was hoping that you guys would all share your experiences of um, why, why you wanted to get involved um, and what this project might mean to you. So um, Peter, um, if you'd like to um, talk to us for a bit. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. Hello, my name is Peter Bryce and I am chair of the Pulmonary Fibrosis Trust. The PF Trust is a UK registered charity established to help all those affected by pulmonary fibrosis. We do this in a number of ways, including raising awareness wherever possible. Despite recognition of the illness, nothing seems to stimulate some sort of urgency to do what can be done to find a cure and to help patients. When I was diagnosed in 2013 with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, I was told to look it up on the internet for more information and that a lung function test would be arranged for six months time. So as soon as I got home, I did indeed look it up on the internet. What I found absolutely horrified me. 
the first thing I read was that it is a progressive lung condition which has no cure. An average life expectancy of just three to five years, although for any one patient, these timescales can be different. They also said that over 6,000 people die from this every year in the UK alone. Yet I knew very little of pulmonary fibrosis, nor did anyone else I knew. I couldn't believe that there was so little awareness of what is a dreadful illness. I couldn't believe that our healthcare system and government would not be doing everything they could to find a cure. Sadly, it became apparent that there was very little funding or research. Pulmonary fibrosis patients have suffered enough and other ways have to be found to help them. This is why I firmly believe REMAP is the answer and has the potential to be a game changer. It is a novel approach that has proved successful for other conditions and will no doubt make a significant contribution to finding new treatments. I urge all of you to support REMAP and any clinical trials created. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for that that moving presentation. Yeah, the, the huge unmet need um, in our community um, and the potential difference that this project could make. Um, Sharma, would you like to tell us a bit about you and, and how you came to be involved in this project? Yes, sure, Wendy, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Shama from England and I'm 59 years old and I have been diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis last year. The question that why I'm here well, generally, I take keen interest in research fields if I come across any and then able to take part in that. In fact, I took part in a different research and that's when I was found that my lungs had scarring. As Peter mentioned, it's not easy to accept this sorts of diagnosis. Within a few weeks of the initial diagnosis, I got involved luckily with the national organization, which is called Action for Pulmonary Fibrosis here in the UK, which supports PF patients and carers. So during my early association with the APF, I was then given an opportunity to take part in the remap. Now the other question that why I became interested in the remap, answer is that my involvement with the remap not only has helped me to focus on something positive, but the knowledge that there are so many people in the medical profession who are working hard to find a cure for this disease. I strongly feel that REMAP is a unique in its fast, inclusive and global approach, whereby the focus will be on existing drugs to be repurposed them. And I'm hoping that more and more people from various countries will join this research and they will get the funding and some cure could be found in my lifetime. Thank you, Wendy. Oh, thank you, Sharma. And thank you for your involvement and your energy. It makes a real difference getting involved at this early stage. Um, thank you so much. Um, Ian, would you like to tell us a bit about how you became involved in this project? Yes, I uh, would, Wendy. Thank you. Uh, my name's Ian Campbell. I'm a retired engineer and I'm, I'm a patient. Um, I was diagnosed with chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis at the end of 2018. I was told the scans that I had had showed I had inflammation and scarring on the lungs. And there was an element of progressive idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis present. I don't know why or how I contracted it. My lung function and my lung capacity was monitored over the following two years by means of HRCT scans and pulmonary function tests. There was evidence of progressive change on scan, but the only new treatment I received was standard reflux medication to lower stomach acid, which made no difference to my lung condition. In all that time, I had no new pulmonary or HP-specific medication prescribed. Two years ago, it was recognised that there was a need to intervene to prevent irreversible fibrotic lung damage. Medication was prescribed by way of the antifibrotic drug, nintedinib, in conjunction with the steroid prednisolone, 
to treat the inflammation of the lungs. This remains the only oral medication I take. My condition has deteriorated since the diagnosis and my quality of life has fallen to a new low of breathlessness and fatigue and some side effects of the medicines. I now depend on ambulatory oxygen throughout the day and the only time I can live without it is when I'm at a computer or when I'm driving or when I'm asleep because there is no physical exertion required. I'm aware that my condition is termed non-IPF and that HP is a rare disease. And I'm also aware that not enough research is carried out specifically on the cause and cure. Last year, I decided to do all I could to help fund research and make myself available for clinical trials, if any, into PF. I made preliminary arrangements to set up a charity of my own for that purpose. So I approached my ILD team specialist in Dundee with the idea who as an alternative steered me toward REMAP ILD initiative. I was drawn to the concept of joining the UK REMAP ILD patient and public advisory group without hesitation. The REMAP ILD idea of conducting clinical trials under controlled conditions that are free from constraints of traditional clinical trials is liberating. The planned scale of the trials on significant numbers of selected patients and the concept of multiple groups of treatment simultaneously is brave and concise. If the diagnosis was cancer or heart disease, any patient will tell you that the worst part of it was waiting for the results. One of the benefits of REMA ILD is that we hope to find out which treatments are working as soon as possible. For me, the part, to be part of the clinical trials for the benefit of people like me or those who come behind me stand to gain a quality of life they would otherwise lose to the disease. To be part of this group gives me the opportunity to see the efforts by professionals and the trials results in real time. And in addition, the monitoring and reportability in real time of potential new and repurposed drugs on selected groups of patients is singularly inspired and can offer fast results for approval or rejection after an agreed trial period. I'm ready and waiting to join the team. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Ian, for firstly the intimate insight into your journey as a patient, but also what inspires you about REMAP ILD. You've just given me goosebumps, actually. Um, Pepe, if I can introduce you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. Hello, everybody, um, wherever you are around the world um, watching us. So my name is Pepe, and I am a patient, an IPF patient of the Royal Brompton. I was diagnosed in 2015, and I'm really enthusiastic about REMAP ILD. So there are some aspects which I find extremely exciting for us patients as well. And uh, one of them is that REMAP ILD is a broader church when it comes to enrollment of patients in the trial. So patients like myself, for example, that were diagnosed over five years ago, sometimes we don't get the chance the chances of participating in trials. Um, other trials have got limited numbers of patients. Rimal PILD has got a wider uh, enrollment than most of the trials that we have seen in the past. Um, and I think from that point of view, it will make a lot of patients that don't participate in other trials be able to be enrolled and benefit from the trial itself. Another aspect I really like about uh, REMAP ILD is the adaptability of it, that um, not only patients will all benefit from joining in the trial, but also we will be able to test a lot more medications than the current availability of medications that are already approved for IPF. Um, in the case of the, the FDA and NICE, um, we only have two medications, perfinidone on intendanib, 
And I think this will enable um, patients to benefit, as I say, from more medications. And the, the one we heard about all the benefits, and I, I will say that for me, also one of the most important aspects of uh, RIMAP ILD is the strength that it has from the point of view of patient involvement. There is a lot of patient involvement within the project itself to shape it and to help medical staff in collaboration with patients to guide it to the benefit of all of us. So that is my, my lot. Wendy, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. And thank thank you. All. Absolute pleasure having you here. And you will be joining us again in the question and answer panel discussion. And for those of you listening online, please do put your question and answers in throughout the rest of the session. Um, and then we will address those towards the end. But you don't need to hold on till the end. You can you can type them in um, as we go along. Um, and so now it's my pleasure to invite Letitia um, to speak to us to provide a real project update of where Remap ILD is now. Um, so welcome, Letitia, and I'll hand over to you. Hi, Wendy. Hi, everyone. Thank you for um, the opportunity to be here is speaking on behalf of a lot of people involved in this project. For me, it is an honor. Next. I am going to speak a little bit about how things are going from the perspective, from more operational perspective. So this map is very exciting. It shows us the uh, from where Remap ILD members come from. And as you can see, these blue lights, they shine throughout the globe. So this is a truly active involvement happening globally and it's amazing to see this energy coming in the project mm -hmm. next and this is all to deliver to you all patients and the community the ILD community this stadium analogy which is the platform where we are going to run we're going to test many different interventions answering patients' needs. So the traditional randomized control trial tests usually one drug ver versus control or placebo. In the REMAP platform, we want to test a wide range of managing strategies that are most of them, some of them are already used, implemented, and we really don't know if we should be doing that. And there are novel drugs and there are other interventions that we can test all of that in this big stadium. Next, I mean platform. And to do that, we need to build our community. And I must tell you, it takes a village to make Remap ILD come true. And not only in terms of number, but in terms of background. So we have ILD specialists, clinical researchers, trialists, statisticians, rheumatologists, we have patient partners, and we have a wide range of background and regional variation, bringing diversity to the table and bringing the voices we need to deliver REMAP ILD. Next. From a framework perspective of this platform, what we have right now, we have the International Trial Steering Committee, we have uh, working groups that are working on treatment domains. That's how that's the, the term that we use in the REMAP platform. And by domain, I mean a group of interventions that are usually mutually exclusive in the decision making. So let's say I'm, I'm going to decide if I'm going to immune suppress my patient. So there is a group of interventions that it's under this label immune suppression that I will choose from, and I usually choose one. So these are domains. We also have the regional management committee groups, and these people are gathering together to make REMAP ILD real and alive in their regions. And that means gathering funding in the region and bringing the necessary people in the region to deliver REMAP ILD. It's not on the figure, but I must say another uh, important group that is being formed is the Health Economics Interna in International Interest Group. And this is another important aspect of REMAP ILD, which will inform policymakers. Next. 
So as I said, as uh, domains, buckets, we have many because this is what are, these are the questions we face when we're managing ILD. So let's say my question is antifibrotic, yes or no? Immune suppression, yes or no? Should I add a steroid? What about pneumocystosis prophylaxis and rehabilitation, oxygen supplementation? How should I treat comorbidities? And on and on and on. There are many, many questions. And this is, this is the aspect of the REMAP ILD that I like the most. It's multifactorial. So it can address many different questions at the same time. And that's about research efficiency with the same patient being randomized across domains that we assume there is no interaction, you gain a statistical power efficiency to answer many questions at once. Next. And to make sure everything is right, we also need to make sure that the data analysis will be perfect. And to get that, we gathered a bunch of people around uh, experts in statistics, in adaptive platforms, together to design REMAP ILD. And this work has been ongoing for months. It's being funded by an accelerator grant provided by the UK NIHR. So thank you for this grant. We are designing REMAP ILD through going through extensive simulations to make sure that we're getting things right. And when we have the data, we're going to, to deliver robust answers to the scientific community. Next. And well, after all I said, you can imagine that costs money, right? So research needs to be funded. And this is a fundamental aspect of REMAP ILD and also a challenge because most of the funding applications are not suited for a global international platform. Usually funding opportunities are regional. So oh, I want to fund a research that is going to be developed in my region. So we're like coming up with a patchwork of funding opportunities to make sure that we fund REMAP ILD globally. Next. So I'll hand it over to Wendy to introduce Chris, or should I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, you pretty much done it there, Letitia. That's wonderful. Um, thank you. Yeah, so moving on from Letitia, we're going to hear from um, both Chris and Sydney talking about two potential groups of treatments that might be some of the building blocks um, of REMAP ILD. So Chris, I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, it's a, an honor to be here and a pleasure to be working with all of you on this and, and uh, really a pleasure to be involved in something that has the potential to make such a huge difference to our, our patients. So I've been asked to speak to you about the uh, immunomodulatory or immunosuppressive domain. And I'm going to start just by reorienting everybody to the, the overall classification uh, in very broad strokes of fibrotic interstitial lung disease. And we've seen this before. Uh, that we can split this up into IPF and non-IPF fibrotic ILD. I'm going to reorient this, this slide a little bit and show it as a bit more of a, a spectrum in a way. And this is a, a dramatic oversimplification, but we have IPF on the left and all of the non-IPF fibrotic ILDs on the right. And we've heard some of these terms before, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma or systemic sclerosis, unclassifiable ILD, and many, many others. And there's a, a long list of about 200 different entities that fall into this. If we look at the, the type of biology uh, that these diseases have underlying them, uh, IPF on the left in blue is a, a very fibrotic uh, interstitial lung disease. And we can look at that based on a number of different factors that we have accessible to us in clinic. Uh, and this can include things like how a patient is presenting in clinic, what type of blood tests they have, what their CT scan looks like, the results of bronchoscopy, and then also the results of a biopsy if a biopsy was performed. So on the left, we have very fibrotic looking interstitial lung diseases. And on the right, we have interstitial lung diseases that are less fibrotic. And these are often thought to be a little bit more of an inflammatory picture, um, although that's a, that's a complicated and, and I guess a sort of oversimplification of, of the complicated disease biology. So we know that there are antifibrotic medications, nintetinib and perfenidone are the two that have been studied and are on the market. Uh, and these have been um, around for a, a little while. Uh, and in IPF and in some of the non-IPF fibrotic ILDs, these are considered standard of care. 
Uh, so on the left, indicated by the green, these are medications that we know should be used in these patients. On the right side, as we get more and more red, less and less fibrotic, it's uncertain if there's benefit to these medications. And we would love to study nintetinib and perfenidone and other antifibrotics in those types of patients. However, there are some challenges to doing that. And in particular, right now, these medications are quite expensive and it would be very difficult for us to fund such a clinical trial. So this is something that we, we are not going to be studying right away. What we do hope to study uh, in the early version of REMAP ILD are two immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory medications called azathioprine and mycophenolate. Uh, azathioprine often goes by aza, mycophenolate often goes by MMF for short form. And these are medications that um, we think uh, may suppress inflammation um, and help decrease the amount of scar tissue formation. So for all of these interstitial lung diseases, and in particular, the non-IPF ILDs, there's an underlying cause or a trigger. Um, so for example, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, it might come from different exposures in your environment. Uh, there are some autoimmune conditions listed here like rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma where your immune system gets a little bit out of whack. And then there are a whole bunch of other things. And these underlying causes or triggers um, we think might trigger inflammation, uh, which over time can lead to scar tissue formation. And the hope is that azathioprine and mycophenolate can decrease the amount of inflammation, which then would decrease the amount of scar tissue formation or fibrosis. And this is what we hope to, to accomplish with these medications. But the fact is that we don't really know, uh, and that's indicated by the, the big red underlined may uh, decrease future development of irreversible fibrosis. So again, coming back to our, our spectrum of, of sorts, uh, we know that these medications, azathioprine and mycophenolate, are, are treatments that we really do want to use in the non-fibrotic interstitial lung diseases. And so on the right side of this diagram, these are patients who aren't really eligible for EMAP ILD because they don't have that fibrosis. Uh, and these are medications that we would use in that type of situation. On the left side of this diagram, indicated by the red, uh, the red X, uh, are patients with IPF, where we know that there isn't enough inflammation, or maybe there isn't any inflammation to justify use of these medications. So we do not want to enroll patients with IPF in this type of uh, a treatment comparison, because we know these, these medications aren't helpful already. There's a large middle ground, um, indicated by the, the gray question mark, where these patients would be eligible for this immunomodulatory domain because we really don't know if these medications work or if they don't work. So a little bit about these two medications. These are both pills. Uh, azathioprine is taken once a day, mycophenolate twice a day. They both take a few months to kick in, so they don't work immediately. They both start at a lower dose and then work their way up, uh, depending on how patients are tolerating the medication. Azathioprine is older and cheaper. Uh, mycophenolate is a little bit newer, um, although still been around for a few decades, and is more expensive. And because of that, the worldwide availability is a little bit different between these as well. Azathioprine is a little bit more widely available. They both have side effects. Um, both of them can cause gastrointestinal side effects, things like nausea, sometimes diarrhea, and both can cause low blood counts, which can predispose to infection. Uh, and azathioprine also can cause liver inflammation. So these aren't always easy medications to take. Uh, they do require monthly blood tests uh, to make sure mostly that the liver is doing okay and that the blood counts haven't dropped uh, below acceptable thresholds. So what the, the trial would look like uh, would be that patients would be randomized. So they would be assigned to receive either azathioprine or mycophenolate or a control. Uh, we would put probably hundreds of patients in each of, of these arms. So this is a large number of patients that we would need to study to determine whether these medications are effective or not. And in order to do that, we would anticipate that we would need about three years uh, in the UK to recruit enough patients to detect a benefit of either azathioprine or mycophenolates against that control group. Uh, as Gisley had discussed before, this is an adaptive trial. So as we are enrolling patients, as we are collecting data, we will be looking at whether uh, there is already a benefit apparent earlier than that three years. Uh, so if we do find that one drug is better than the control, we already have our answer. We don't need to continue on with the study. And that's different than how clinical trials are performed historically. So that's what adaptive means. 
Adaptive also means that the proportion of patients in each group can change over time as we learn which intervention is more or less effective. So as an example, uh, we can say, as an example, let's say azathioprine is looking more and more like a loser as we enroll more patients and mycophenolate is looking more and more like a winner. What we do in that situation is we start randomizing fewer patients to azathioprine, the so-called loser, and more patients to mycophenolate, the so-called winner. And by doing that, we are again enrolling more patients in a, an arm or if a treatment that is known or increasingly known to be effective. Uh, this is also a multifactorial study. Um, so patients will have the opportunity to also be given other treatments. And this is particularly important for patients in the control group. In a historical clinical trial, if you're getting a control uh, intervention, um, you are not actually getting treatment. Whereas in a remap trial uh, where it's multifactorial, patients in the control group will still have the opportunity to be given other treatments that are under study. Uh, that also goes for the azathioprine and the mycophenolate groups uh, who could actually be on two different treatments, um, not just the azathioprine or the mycophenolate. So they may also be randomized to metformin as an example, which Sydney will be talking about in a couple minutes. How we will be looking at whether these drugs are effective or not effective, the benefit will be tested based on conventional things like pulmonary function tests, your force vital capacity or your diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide, functional tests like the walk test and sit to stand test, uh, patient reported outcome measures or PROMs like quality of life, dyspnea or shortness of breath and cough, and then also survival. Uh, we'll also be looking at safety, uh, so side effects and how well patients are able to continue to tolerate the medications once they've started them. And putting that all together, uh, what we hope to find is that these medications work. Uh, and we obviously want to show that there are new um, or, or repurposed medications that we can use in a larger group of patients and have benefit from those medications. So that's our, our goal. By doing the study though, it's still helpful even if we show that these medications don't work. Uh, and there are a couple of important things about this. First of all, some patients uh, around the world are getting these medications um, and we're still not quite sure whether they work or not. Uh, and it's possible that these medications don't work, in which case we're giving patients medications that they don't really need and don't really benefit from. In addition, by doing this study, we will find that uh, we will learn a whole lot more about the biology of these diseases, and that will give us a lot of insight into what future treatments we should be studying uh, beyond the, the ones that we're looking at in this specific clinical trial. And that will give us um, the, the next stage of remap ILD, a, a big head start for that. So at this point, I'll, I'll pass it back to, to Wendy. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for providing a, an overview of one set of potential treatments and the rationale for why we might want to look at them in a bit more detail. Um, Sydney, if you'd like to join us uh, and, and talk about a drug that's actually currently used for diabetes that we think may have potential in patients with um, fibrotic interstitial lung disease. So Sydney, if I can uh, um, welcome you. Great. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an, an honor and privilege to speak to everyone here. Okay, so as um, as was covered earlier, um, there are many different types of fibrotic interstitial lung disease, um, including idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, as well as a multitude of other types of fibrotic interstitial lung diseases that aren't IPF. And what we know is that the processes driving fibrosis um, can be very similar regardless of the type. So the thought is, could we find a medication that could be helpful at treating pulmonary fibrosis across patients that have multiple different types of, of pulmonary fibrosis? So this is the, what Chris showed um, a few minutes ago, thinking about fibrotic interstitial lung disease. And within that, we have the category of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but that only represents uh, small portions of patients with pulmonary fibrosis. There are a number of patients that have what we call non-IPF fibrotic interstitial lung diseases. And these patients, uh, just as well as the IPF patients, um, desperately need new therapies. So what I'm gonna to talk to you in the next few minutes is about a medication called metformin, who, and Wendy mentioned, this is a, a diabetes medication. And so we know that new treatments for fibrotic interstitial lung diseases are, need, are needed. 
And as I mentioned a minute ago, we think that a lot of the processes driving fibrosis are similar, regardless of it's IPF or pulmonary fibrosis from rheumatoid arthritis or systemic sclerosis or other entities. And what are those processes? Well, some of what we're learning more recently is um, abnormalities in um, different metabolic processes, as well as um, aging-related re mechanisms can really play important roles in driving fibrosis. And this leads us to consider metformin. Um, metformin is known to have metabolic effects, hence it's used as a um, uh, to target high glucose in, in patients that have uh, diabetes. But also notably, it has anti-aging or what we refer to as senolytic properties. So there's been a lot of um, interest in, meta, in metformin, so to speak, as um, perhaps being able to, to treat a whole host of, of different ailments. Although I should note that um, there is, there is uh, a need for more data to be able to, to um, fully back up the enthusiasm. Okay, so let's talk a bit more about metformin. Um, it's an oral medication that's commonly used to treat diabetes. So diabetes is a very common um, condition and it's a very common condition or comorbidity or co-occurring condition in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. So what do we know about patients that have pulmonary fibrosis who also take metformin for their diabetes? Well, there is some information we know and, and there is some data to suggest that metformin may improve clinical outcomes um, looking at patients specifically with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And what do I mean by clinical outcomes? Well, um, if we look at large data sets, um, and this is data uh, by insurance companies in the US. If you look at large data sets and you look back on kind of what happened to the patients, um, there is a suggestion that metformin use may actually reduce the risk of, of hospitalization and, and may also um, reduce the risk of death in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis that are receiving metformin for their diabetes. And so that leads to a question, well, if there's promising data and metformin is widely available, why doesn't my doctor prescribe it for, for me? Without a clinical trial, it's really impossible to know whether metformin is beneficial, specifically beneficial for patients that have fibrotic lung disease, um, including those that do not have uh, diabetes. So the, the thought behind metformin is, could we find a medication that could be helpful um, for patients, regardless of if they have diabetes or not, across a wide range of pulmonary fibrosis types. And, and because of that, because we think it might be helpful no matter the entity, that lends this to be um, a medication um, that could be, um, that we're proposing to use in patients with any type of pulmonary fibrosis. So there is no exclusion for, by subtypes, which is different from um, uh, Chris's um, talk uh, he just gave, in which patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis were not eligible for the immunotherapy domain. So let's talk about metformin. Um, similar to currently current antifibrotic medications, metformin is a pill. Um, depending on how the the dose is formulated, um, it could it could be the dosing could be as infrequent as once a day. So again, this differs from current antifibrotic antifibrotic treatment, which depending on the medication is two or three times daily. For effective timing. One reason to do this, the trial is really to determine one, is this medication effective? And two, over what timing it takes for this medication to work. However, we do think that metformin efficacy, if it does show to be effective, the timing will be after a few months in terms of efficacy, similar to currently available antifibrotics. Um, several things that are important to note that, that set metformin apart from currently available antifibrotic therapies. One is its cost. It's incredibly cheap. Two is availability. This is a medication that's available worldwide um, and that's not as limited in terms of the access of being able to provide to patients. Side effects are not uncommon. Um, these are gastrointestinal side effects similar to antifibrotic um, medications, including nausea and diarrhea. In most cases, um, these side effects can be 
manage or um, uh, by a dose escalation to start, uh, similar to what has done with antifibrotic therapy. Um, however, as a whole, what's reported about metformin um, is that overall, it's considered to be a well-tolerated medication. Although there are people um, that will have side effects as a whole, um, we are we think that it's the side effect profile is going to be better for patients than the current antifibrotic treatments. Um, monitoring. Um, the monitoring uh, is um, blood tests that, that really range by pr provider preference, but, but oftentimes will be every three months. So this is similar to what is commonly done for people on nintetinib or profinadone. So how would this study be done? Well, um, it would be available for any patient um, any patient who has pulmonary fibrosis uh, could be considered for this study in which they would be randomized to either refrieve metformin or here is listed as control, control, but basically an important point is that patients could continue to be whatever treatment they're being maintained on for their pulmonary fibrosis when they're enrolled and then metformin would just be added to that. So nothing is being taken away. Um, and then, then for patients who are um, assigned to the metformin group, that is added. And then the control patients that are receiving what we consider standard of care, those patients are playing an, an exquisitely important role because they help us to have a comparison to determine whether or not metformin is effective. And as Chris mentioned before, this is part of the, the larger trial um, and it is adaptive. Uh, meaning that the, the numbers of how many people we need could change depending on if we're seeing um, the, what type of effect we're seeing. So we anticipate that recruitment will occur over three years, um, but potentially sooner with uh, the, the potentially sooner that the results become available. And the proportions of patients in each group may change over time as we learn um, which intervention is more or less effective. And again, this is kind of fitting into the larger trial because it's not just metformin that's being studied. And then importantly, um, patients that participate will also have the opportunities to be given treatments from other domains. So these are the, the, the kind of the two domains that we're putting forward right now, the immunosuppressive domain and the, the metabolic domain. But we hope that in the coming years, we will have an armamentarium of medications in our basket. And then patients will have the opportunity to um, be considered for um, multiple different uh, treatments or domains. So how do we determine whether or not um, it's, it's effective? Well, we're looking for signs of benefit and what are they? The most standard ones being uh, changes in lung function over time, but that's just one measurement. And other things that are important are functional measurements because those are things that are starting to reflect um, how a patient functions. Um, and then we're also um, very interested in seeing how these medications affect patients' report, um, reports of, of symptomatology, so patient-reported outcome measurements. And we're also going to be looking at survival. And then in addition to that, to look at benefit, every type of medication, the benefits are weighed against the side effects or the risks. So what are the side effects and how do these compare in patients that are already on entetinib or profinadone? And how do they how 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 um, how do they potentially interact? So all these things are important questions because the goal would be to have a, a, a medication that is uh, low cost, widely available, um, and that has minimal side effects or and is quite tolerable to be able to give to our patients. And then what do we suspect to find? Well, the hope would be that we would find that metformin works in fibrotic ILD, because uh, then we would have a medication that could be useful to, to patients and one that could, um, could get into patients really quickly because this medication is already approved and it could easily be quickly prescribed um, from one's provider uh, to treat a large number of patients. 
However, if, if this medication doesn't work, um, while that is disappointing, ultimately that is helpful information because again, we're gonna be collecting a large amount of information um, on the different patients that participate. And that should help us to determine, well, is there a small group of patients that might be um, shown to have a benefit for metformin? Or if it's not helpful, it'll help us think better about why we think it wasn't helpful and what can we do next time or other types of medications or different pathways that we want to investigate to try to be able to come up with medications for our patients. So I will stop there. Oh, thank you so much, Sydney. Really, um, really comprehensive introduction to, to metformin and, and why we might be so interested in that um, initially. Um, so if I could welcome everybody back now to put your cameras on and we're going to start our question and answer session. Um, thank you for those members of the audience that have already submitted your questions. Some we've typed responses to and others we're keen to answer live today. And I know that many of you provided questions ahead of this um, webinar um, and some of those um, we will be answering today as well so um, yeah thank you everybody um, for your ongoing um, involvement um, so yeah feel free to put your questions and answers questions in the chat and we'll answer some live and we'll, we'll type some answers um, the most asked question is when is this starting like when is this happening um, and I wonder whether um, Gisley you might might speak to that for a moment or two so that's a great question, um, but unfortunately one we don't have the answer to uh, at the moment. What we hope is that there is a timeline for uh, submitting proposals for funding, uh, which we should hear from towards the end of this year. So should everything go well and uh, the, the UK's proposal be accepted, then we would anticipate that the study would start in the UK in the second quarter, so April through June of 2024, if all our stars align. Now, it's a horrible phrase, but we talk about shots on goal. So the good news is that other places are actively submitting grants. So I know that Sydney is uh, submitting a grant in the US. Uh, and may be able to speak to what's going on in the US. And Letitia is uh, submitting a grant in South America, and Chris will be submitting a, a, a grant in Canada. So hopefully one of us uh, will be successful in the uh, near future, and then we should be able to start randomizing in, in the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, thank you, Gisley. So I don't know if Sydney, Letitia or Chris, you want to talk about more from an international flavour of timelines. But yeah, I know the, the interest is like, wh when's the start date? When can we, when can we get enrolled? Um, and it's never soon enough, right? Um, we need these things to be happening now. Um, Sydney, did you want to come in? Sure, I can come in. Um, so we have... Uh... Uh, two large funding organizations in the United States, one being the National Institutes of Health, which I think is probably similar to the organization in the UK to which um, Giesley is submitting. And then we also have the Department of Defense, and we have put in a letter of intent um, for a project, a clinical trial that uses metformin um, through the Department of Defense. Department of Defense is very interested in supporting trials in pulmonary fibrosis, recognizing that a large number of exposures um, um, through military work um, are um, risk factors for pulmonary fibrosis of, of, of different etiology. So we are hopeful that um, that there will be enthusiasm there. And, and this, this funding organization has a long, um, uh, has a track record of, of funding um, kind of um, newer models of clinical trials um, that are focused on kind of embedding within patient care and um, uh, kind of similar in, in, in theme or, or thought to what's proposed to remap. Thank you. Um, Letitia. So we're also preparing uh, to submit a proposal for the Brazilian Ministry of Health, PROAGI program. And this is going to be in the second semester this year. And if we're successful, remap ILD will be funded in the region is starting in 2024. Just uh, 
from a global perspective, just to help uh, the community understand how it will work, in, re in different regions, it's possible that different domains will be activated. So we're, we're hopeful that at a certain point, all of the domains like uh, immunosuppressive domains, senolytics and more will be activated in all the regions. But in the beginning, we have to really choose that domain one or two that are really, really appealing to the funder. So it might be possible that in your region, Let's say Remap LD will start with one domain or two, or and then things pick up. Thanks, Leticia. That's really helpful. Um, these building blocks around the world, there isn't that single pot of money where we could go live initially, um, and we have to build things gradually. Um, Chris. Sure. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, I would echo what everybody has said so far. One thing that I would add is You've heard that there are applications happening in the UK and applications happening in Brazil and in the US and, and in Canada. And each of those applications are being put forth by people who are working together and, and we're quite good at working together. But these are all separate applications uh, and they're all going to be adjudicated by different review panels, different countries, different priorities. And that really is something that uh, as a community, I think one of the take home messages, I think one of the future learnings for reading that by LD is that especially for rare diseases like interstitial lung disease, we need to build more of a global community and have all of these applications integrated um, much more comprehensively than they are right now. Uh, it, it becomes very challenging to do this sort of piecemeal, even as we're trying to coordinate things as we are. So if, if you're somebody out there listening to this and you have the ability to advocate for a more global approach to these types of, types of trials, uh, we would really value your, your help with that. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, really valuable point. Um, moving away from when you can get involved, some people had some specific questions actually about if you were to be able to take part. And there's a number of questions. And I don't know whether um, Peter, Ian, Ian and Pepe, you could expand upon this from the patient perspective, because they were the questions that, that some of you have raised as well in that, what if I'm already taking treatments, not just for fibrosis, but for other conditions as well? And I wondered whether um, whether you would like to expand on that a bit, because it's something that we've talked about. Well, I think on that point, Wendy, is uh, pulmonary fibrosis and ILD is a very complicated illness. And it's very difficult from a patient's point of view to comment on all the different variations and the effect of various treatment. I think this is one more for the clinicians to explain. I would say. But yeah, I, I guess it's inevitable that those with pulmonary fibrosis are also going to have a, a lot of other conditions, um, such as the nature of getting older, I think. But uh, I think that's more for the clinicians to answer. Yeah, thank you, Peter. I was thinking um, more from the concerns that you shared that, hang on a minute, it's not just um, antifibrotics that I'm taking, but other medication and how might they interact and questions around safety, not just can I continue taking that medication, but is it safe to do so and how might these medications interact and how might they be monitored? So um, I wonder um, whether Sydney, you'd like to come in on this? Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent question because it, it goes back to the, to the question about let's take metformin. If the data is promising and it's available, why shouldn't I take it? And I think this is an important question that, that medications interact with each other and people have comorbidities that interact and, and we don't know how they all interact. And so the, the best way to, to learn is to be able to do a trial um, and help us to understand what these interactions are. And so when we We've spent a lot of time trying to design what we consider the inclusion or exclusion criteria. So with inclusion, we want to make this such that as many people can be included as possible, because many times trials, especially those that are sponsored by pharmaceutical companies, um, have a very, very limited scope in terms of who can be enrolled. However, um, we've also been um, put in some key exclusion criteria for things that we know that are safety interactions for metformin or for azathioprine or other medications, not to prevent people from being able to participate in the trial, but, but to have a, um, a, a you know, a, a stop, so to speak, on, on um, to make sure we preserve patient safety. So I think all these things have been been very consider, considered very thoughtfully. And then the other thing in terms of a medication that we think about where we might see the field moving forward 
um, you, we can perhaps learn from what we've seen with people with other types of chronic diseases. Take people that have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Oftentimes people will need more than one inhaler or inhaler that has more than one medication in it. And I would suspect that treating pulmonary fibrosis in the future is gonna be the same way. And that's why it's very important for us to be able to allow patients that are already on nintetinib or perfinidone to be able to take those medications. But it's also important for us to allow patients that are not on those medications either because they weren't able to tolerate them or their preference, because we might find that what, what if metformin you know, was equally effective for the, for the people that aren't on any, any treatment as, as, as patients already on antifibrotic? And then you might open up a realm to, in the future, you could have a head-to-head -head study of a very cheap medication with a medication that has a lot of side effects and it's expensive. So I think these are all really good questions and important because um, we cannot look at it, I, IPF or, or fibrotic lung disease with narrow glasses. We have to think about how they fit in term, times to, into how um, patients' other um, clinical illnesses are medications and things like that. Wendy, if you allow me one quick comment just on the operational perspective of these. Um, so people are concerned about, I'm taking some medications, how am I joining the remap ILD? From an operational perspective, the remap ILD has very broad entry criteria, as Gisli showed. And then for each domain, there are some additional criteria, mostly to ensure safety. So for example, an IPF patient will not be allowed to be randomized in the immunosuppressive domain. In the immunosuppressive domain, there will be some extra safety eligibility criteria. So the patient enter the platform and then there are additional doors, let's say doors, that the patient can enter or not, and even to opt out not to enter a certain door. Thanks. Thank you, Letitia. That's helpful. Pepe, come in. I just, I just wanted to, to say that one of the best things we can do as humans is to contribute to the common good. And I think in this case, because for whatever reason, life has put IPF on us, uh, I think we, we have got some duty to try to help um, for ourselves, as well as in the case, for example, patients that have got familial IPF for their families and for other people. So I think it's very, very important that whatever, you know, takes place going forward, collaboration is as strong as possible. We have to trust the medical staff to make sure that we are safe in doing the trials. But from the patient point of view, it's, it's our duty as, as patients really to collaborate. And we have to do it. Thank, uh, thank you, Pepe. Go on, Ian. I would agree with Pepe. Uh, and Letitia especially because the safety um, aspect needs to be looked at by a professional before it gets exposed, the trial gets exposed to the patient. And the patient will believe in the professional when he's taking the trials, the pills for the trials. So absolutely, we, we, we want to do the trials, we need to qualify for it. And if it's a safety qualification, then the professional is there first. Um, there's a few questions that sort of expand upon this point about, I'm already on treatment, can I continue? Um, not just for antifibrotics, but other comorbidities. But there's also questions about, oh, I've had this for a really long time, um, or I've been like diagnosed for a long period, can I still take part? So um, Chris, I wonder whether you could speak to that. Someone was asking that they've been diagnosed for over 10 years and they're already on some treatments. Would they would they still be eligible to take part or not? Sure, it's a good question. Uh, and, and one that we, I wouldn't say we struggle with, but one that we definitely want to, to address uh, in our eligibility criteria. Uh, in historical clinical trials, patients who have a long-standing diagnosis or who aren't progressing are typically excluded from those, those clinical trials. And the, the hope for remap ILD is to be much more inclusive than those historical trials. So we want to be very uh, careful about including as, as many patients as possible. Uh, there are potentially some uh, additional considerations that need to be be taken. So as, as an example, some of the things that we discussed, if you've been stable for 10 years 
and we're using a treatment that is intended to slow progression, if you're not progressing, that, that drug is not going to have much benefit to you. Um, having said that, uh, we're, not, we're not magicians. We don't have a crystal ball that is uh, able to predict the future for everybody. So there is potentially still some benefit to studying that patient, but we do expect that there would be less magnitude of benefit in somebody who's been stable for such a long time. To address the second question, if you're on treatment, do you have to stop that treatment? The answer to that would be an unambiguous no. Uh, you, you don't need to stop treatment uh, to come into a trial like this, especially if that's a treatment that is, is known uh, or even suspected to be working for you. Uh, we do not want to take you off of that kind of therapy uh, to go into what's essentially an experimental uh, therapy. Thank you. Um, there's, a, there's a number of questions um, also in the in the chat and um, I invite um, our patient representatives to draw out those questions that they feel most pertinent as we go forward. Um, in terms of the complexity, how do you know if people are taking lots of different treatments, which one is actually working? Um, how do you how do you do that? Um, Gisley, would you like to comment? I was oh. really, I was really hoping, Wendy, you would not ask me to comment on that question. <laughs> well, so I, I can answer this question. Um, it's, it's actually magic. Um, um, I think Letitia showed a slide. We're working with a, a, a statistical company and very consultants that are world leading experts in data analysis of adaptive platform trials. A lot of data comes in, a lot of data um, needs to be um, carefully curated. And these guys are the experts in that. And that's where the, the magic um, magic wand comes in. Um, but if anyone wants to speak uh, um, in more detail, otherwise you just have to trust me uh, as a <laughs> that, 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 that there, there is magic behind this. I think, I think, uh... It's not quite magic, to, to be fair to Barry. It, it's statistics, it's complex statistics, but it can be that the answers can be teased out statistically because we'll know which patients are receiving which drugs at which time. And because it's all protocolized, it is possible to tease that out statistically. The, the challenge for those of us who don't live, breathe, and eat Bayesian statistics is that we can't explain it. And so calling it magic is a very good way of uh, describing it. Yeah, so what is actually happening is that fortnightly, an international team of statisticians and the remap team are meeting to understand the statistics and the modelling of this um, platform trial. Um, and for any adaptive platform trial, there's a lot of learning and preparation that goes on way before you even enrol a single patient. Um, and so this, this thorough understanding of the data and how we expect patients might progress and how treatment might affect that um, has been gone through and continues to be gone through with a fine tooth comb with continual learning and adaptation. So it's not just the platform that's adapting, it's our learning and understanding as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully that that looks to answer um, some of that. Um, Can I add one other thing, Wendy? Um, please, about yeah, that, we, we actually would love to see patients on multiple different treatments. Uh, as an example, if you're on metformin and mycophenolate, maybe those two drugs work really, really well together and there's synergy. And we don't know that unless we're studying them together. And it may be that there's a cocktail of drugs that really work well together and individually, maybe they don't work super well together. So this type of study really allows us to understand better the complexity of multiple treatments uh, taken at a given time for patients. Thank you. Yeah, that's really good. And you see in other disease areas that patients aren't just prescribed a single treatment. It's often multiple treatments and combinations of treatments that give the best survival and improved quality of life. And at the moment in pulmonary fibrosis, we're really limited um, and we want patients to have more, more options and individualised um, medication. Sort of leading on from the data question, there's also well, if how does it work, not just the data and how we analyze it and you know which treatment's working but how are we going to collaborate internationally like a, a country's going to work independently and hold on to their data or is it going to be shared across the world how how's that going to work um Letitia so <laughs> that we're lucky I would say Remap ILD is lucky to have such a successful platform trial to be inspired uh to drive inspiration from so that's Remap Cap and we have been many, many meetings with REMAP CAP folks from different regions just to learn 
how this international collaboration worked for them in a way that we can mirror them. And it, we have been, I must say, we have been successful because we have been putting in grants in regionally, but making sure that they are in harmony with the global vision, mission, and the core protocol that we are developing. So yes, we intend to work together. We anticipate many challenges, especially on data sharing and governance. And we're also working on that to make sure that this does not prevent Remap ILD from happening. I am positive we're going to overcome all the challenges and uh, this is a work in progress. So I don't have all the answers laid out how we made things happen, but I see intention to make it happen. I see an inspiration on the horizon and I see it happening. So I'm very positive about that. Thank, thanks, Leticia. Um, there's some questions around, and, and I understand this, that we're talking about um, learning as we go and, and um, enrolling more patients in the arms where we see that there's potential benefit. So we're powering that, that element of the trial so we can get a readout sooner. But what about the patients that are already enrolled? Can they switch arms? Um, how, does, how does that work? And so over time, when a new treatment might come on board, do you get to take part in that if you were enrolled six months previously like um how, how does that work in terms of as we learn what happens to the patients that are already enrolled on the trial so can patients move between arms this is a challenging question you're asking us about uh, a re-randomization of the same patient honestly i i don't know if like Chris, uh, Gisley, Sydney have this answer, but I anticipate it could be possible for different domains, for the same domain. I understand that the data point needs to be unique, so the patient would not be allowed to be re-randomized for the same domain. Any additional thoughts? But this is a question for Barry. <laughs> hey, it's a great question. I think that the hope is that we would build a, a platform that is like a living organism and it, it grows. And so as once the kind of old organism, the initial is gotten in a new one, then patients could then be perhaps in you know, Remap 2.0. So these, these platforms have existed for other trials, um, notably patients with um, ALS, uh, the neurologic condition, um, breast cancer. And so I, I think that with this, if we think of it as a living organism over time, um, you may not be in every single part of the, the iteration, but there will be opportunities to, to continue to participate as it maybe grows or, or changes shape. The, the other thing I would add is that once, once we reach that threshold where a treatment has been proven to be beneficial, then you get that treatment, um, no matter what you were getting initially. If you were in the control arm, as soon as we reach that threshold of benefit, we we publish that and and you get that drug. Uh, so you may not be re-randomized in that study, uh, in that specific intervention, but you would get that treatment uh, soon after uh, that threshold has been reached. Pepe, do come in. Thank you. One of the things I have been listening to is the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And to me, um, the learning that takes place within the study will be very, very important, but also outside of the study. So if anybody is being not included in the trial, because after 10 years or 15 years, his IPF has no progress, I want to hear about him. I want to know what he's doing, because that may be also the key to, to doing something in the trial that benefits more patients. It is very uncommon, as you probably know, for somebody to have pulmonary fibrosis and, you know, and no progress for 10 years. That, that is, um, you know, I haven't heard much about that. Never met anybody that could actually say that to me. Um, so yes, <laughs> you have. Peter, Peter says he's one of those. Well, Peter, please publish your agenda, daily medication and diet, and let's see what, what we can all learn from that. But uh, yeah, so within the trial and outside the trial, I think all the, 
all the benefits that patients can derive, you know, we need them as soon as possible. And the timing also, uh, listening to the timing of the, of the applications and how long it will take to get approved and things like that. You know, it is a worrying thing, especially because the, you know, IPF, for example, is progressive and uh, time is very valuable. So we need to push as hard as possible, as fast as possible to get it there. Thank you, Thank Pepe. You. And I just wanted to reflect, actually, that the question that came in about um, different arms of treatment and can you be re-randomised is an excellent question. And we don't have all the answers. Um, we're learning as we go, as we develop this platform trial. Um, and it's those questions from patients that really drive our work forward. And there's a question in the chat as well about um, how have patients been involved in this in this trial design to date? Um, and I'd also tie into that, like the why, uh, the absolute benefit of that, um, having these opportunities to engage and have those questions, the people that this trial is going to be for. Um, that's why we have this involvement. And, and I wonder whether, um, Pepe, you spoke in your presentation about what, one of the aspects of this trial that you really like is the involvement. And I know that you've been involved in lots of different research projects at lots of different stages of development. And what feels different potentially about REMAP ILD and, and, and your involvement, if I, if I can ask you, Pepe. Um, but Peter, Ian, Sharma, please feel free to join in in terms of the involvement of patients and, and the value uh, of getting involved. Yes, I, I feel that involvement of patients is particularly in big numbers will be more beneficial. A lot of the trials I have seen or done myself, um, you know, taking part, you know, 18 patients, 20 patients. I think that number is really not significant in terms of uh, what the results may show. Um, and, uh, and I think it's, it's also very important to know that everybody in the in the trial will benefit. So people that start on the placebo, sooner or later, if things progress and benefits are seen to be um, gained, maybe will join the other groups and, and benefit from the medication. I think it's very important. One of the big questions still in the air is, will patients be able to choose what medication they're on or will be guided by the medical staff to say, look, these are the medication that I think in your condition will benefit you from the beginning. Yeah, so that's something in um, Remap Cap. So Remap Cap is another adapted platform trial in community acquired pneumonia, um, and it has it's been established for a longer period of time than us, um, and is an inspiration to us as as a, as a group. Um, but in that platform trial, um, patients are able to say which groups of therapies they may or may not want to take part in. You don't get to choose which therapy within that you would select, but whether you do want to be eligible, to, whether if you are eligible you are willing to. So for example, in this instance, if you had, when um, Sydney and Chris talked about those two potential groups of treatment, um, you may say, actually, I'm not interested in, in metformin, I'm just interested in immunosuppression. Uh, and patients would be able to elect which they opt in and out of. Um, and all of this is up for discussion. So this is the wonderful thing about Remap ILD, of the stage of development that we are now and ongoing, is that nothing is set in stone. We're constantly learning. So in the UK, we have a patient advisory group um, of which all the um, patients here are part of that involves um, patients, carers, um, bereaved family members um, that are helping with the design of Remap ILD, um, but also in events um, such as today to share a, just general awareness of the project so that when it does come, hopefully when it comes, when we get funding, um, that our community are ready and waiting to take part. Um, but in terms of the, the design of the trial, it's, it's fundamental. This 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 project, we go right back to our values, um, is for patients. Um, and it's about having the right people around the table at the right time. And without involvement of patients and people more generally affected by pulmonary fibrosis, because the decision to take part in research isn't for a single entity, your family will be involved in that as well. Um, Maybe if you have someone that supports your care coming to um, hospital appointments. And so it's really important that we're, we're taking account of and involving our entire community. Um, and, and that's the way it works in Remap ILD. Um, everyone is, is driven um, by 
that absolute need um, to make a difference. Um, so yeah, we've got lots of, sorry, go ahead. So I totally agree, but it's we are the patients. It's in our interest to do what we can to help the clinicians, the experts come on. Well, be nice for a cure, but for some form of treatment which can help our symptoms and the progress or lack of progression, I should say, in the in the illness. Um, we need to do this as patients. Um, we've got no choice, really, have we? I mean, we're not talking about something or somebody else. We're talking about ourselves we're in this situation not by choice we have to do what we can to help and i think that's important thanks Would peter you, if i can just have a, a quick word i i've never taken part in any trials before um, but i am glad that i'm involved in this group because it gives me something to hope for and it gives me information in real time we know that you will get results quickly or as quickly as they come and we will get the result on the back of that immediately and that it makes me feel good and that feel good does something for people so I'm, glad, I'm just glad to be here in the group and to be able to help if i can thank you ian yeah and i can see sharma you're nodding nodding your head too um okay. could, I, could i just come in to, to to sort of echo that point uh from a from a data-driven perspective, there is a huge amount of data uh, showing that patients who participate in clinical trials, regardless of what the clinical trial in, is, do better, regardless of what the disease is. And it's not entirely clear why that is the case, uh, but it is the case even in traditional clinical trials. And we anticipate that that effect will be even greater in a remap trial. So although, we can't say that the, the trial drug is what's causing the effect. The, the fact that people are interacting and are being uh, engaging in clinical trials is hugely beneficial to patients. Thank you, Gisley. That feels like a really um, nice place to close the session, to be honest. Um, <laughs> um, we thank you all, our speakers, um, for your attention and our audience. Thank you for being so engaged and asking um, us so many great questions. Um, we would ask that if you've attended the event, you fill out our webinar feedback. You will have an email after the event, but there's also a QR code on screen for those of you in the know how, how to do that. Um, there's information on our Twitter account, which is here, um, but also on um, uh, on various websites. So you'll get a follow up email with some additional information. I know there's still some questions about how, how can I take part in this trial? And as yet, we don't have funding, but we will let you know and we will have future public engagement events. Um, and if you have a real keen interest to get involved as a patient, um, in this design and development phase, um, then you can follow up with the with an email to us um, at research at actionpf.org. Um, and, and we'll put that email also um, in um, the in a follow-up email to you all. Um, but thank you very much for your time and um, yeah, all the best.